college in Canada. So it's not nearly the same level of students uh, as Harvard. But again, by going to peer instruction, dramatically reduce the number of students who drop in, which is certainly an important thing. I can also talk a lot about the gender gap, which is an area of research for me, that the gender gap gets smaller with peer instruction and collaborative learning, as opposed to traditional, where the gender gap is so I'm not going to go through all of this, but in terms of you implementing some of these ideas or making up your own, because maybe you're going to come up with your own interactive engagement techniques. You know, why does it work? And this is definitely a good study. So just to, I'm just going to give you two of these. One from uh, a host from pretty good publications. Uh, this was from a bio, biology class. And what they concluded from their study was this, and I will read it out just to the translation. These students are arriving at conceptual understanding on their own through the process of group discussion and debate. And that's why it's working. They are constructing their own ways of thinking about the world. It's not good enough just to tell them what the way it is. Another important result about how to improve uh, learning and also exam performance they compared a whole bunch of different ways of studying, and I'll just show you this from the, got covered in the New York Times. They compared more studying, or using concept mapping techniques, or actually doing tests, where they would find out if they were right or wrong, or uh, studying even more. And you can see that the process of going through a test, finding out if they're right or wrong, and getting that feedback helped them uh, help them in future evaluations. So you can see that this happens with peer instruction. That there's this, every class, there's many opportunities for students to try and think about something, pull it out from their background understandings, see, get rid of the distraction, to be able to answer, and if they answer wrong, they get that feedback. So I really, I'm not going to, as I said, I can't really do this all justice, but just to give you a sense, it has been tested and people are trying to understand better how it works. So just to summarize then this, this stage, before I ask you to actually go to your groups and do another activity to help us move forward, that when I was teaching, I realized that my usual feedback channels that were telling me whether I was teaching well or not were way too slow. You know, you look at the midterm exams, the results were not good, or they were biased. That was me standing and giving a brilliant lecture and the people in the front row all nodding. While the people in the back row, they might have been nodding, but it was nodding because they were calling <laughs> So to, I was getting bad data, and I couldn't make good decisions based on bad data. So I had to do at least some testing in a somewhat rigorous fashion. And that helped me understand how to make changes, and you can make these sort of testing if you so want as well. That peer instruction has additional benefits beyond just understanding concepts. And we saw that in terms of retention in programs. And why does it work? The essential parts or pieces of it is that there's discussion, debate, students are getting immediate feedback every class. And they're having to explain their reasoning. We were talking earlier about what do students need in the real world. They won't be writing that many exams in the real world. They will have to convince others of their ideas and we're giving them that practice and that training. All right, so where do we as a group go from here? This has been relatively abstract, though I tried to make it a bit more concrete. What I would like you to think about is, how do you improve the data that you have in your course? So I'm going to ask you to go back to your sheets and create a list of feedback channels that you can create in your course that help you better understand if you're teaching. So some other, some new ways that you can implement so you can evaluate. And I will say that is not exams. Exams, I don't know about you, but if my students, the exam results are all over the place. If they have three exams right before mine, they will not do well on mine. And that is something that I can't control. So exams, I don't think, are a good way of evaluating my teaching at all. 
So, and what I'm going to ask you to do is to share these results all together so that we can come up with some ideas that you'll find out that will work for you. We won't have as much time for this, I think it's pretty concrete, but if you could go into your groups, and again, what feedback channel or channels can you create in your course to help you better evaluate your own teaching? Okay, eh, respecto a, digamos, a cómo evaluar los sistemas, más, más que nada, o sea, saber si los estudiantes que estamos en programa de enseñar, eh, se nos ocurrieron tres cosas. Eh, y, la, y la primera eh, que dijimos, bueno, es directamente preguntándoles a ellos cómo se sienten con la explicación de un tema. Eh, sabemos que tiene sus, o sea, que no puede ser la única, la única representación que tengamos. Eh, pero que una, una posibilidad y que, que de ahí que sacar eh, lo que ellos nos digan es preguntándoles eh, directamente puede ser eh, los más animados te van a decir cosas eh, normalmente tal vez los, sobre todo si sienten que no está muy bien la clase no te lo van a decir entonces la otra posibilidad es pedirles que, eh, que, que te respondan eh, de forma anónima y te dejen los papeles al final de la clase y pues tomar nota de lo que de lo que ellos sienten que no les está realmente enseñando la clase eh, la otra manera que se nos ocurre es solicitarles que hagan eh, mapas conceptuales una vez que tienen que, se, que se terminamos sus temas decirles ok, bueno, haga un mapa conceptual quien entiende puede armar un buen mapa conceptual quien no, no lo va a lograr eh, la otra que proponíamos era hacer eh, pedirles que hagan exposiciones ya sea de un concepto teórico o de explicar un problema también hay muy claro quién está entendiendo y quién no de manera tal que no pueden saber si la clase de uno les está rindiendo de alguna manera eh, y otro que proponía que un compañero de matemáticas se nos pareció una muy buena idea es eh, solicitarles a ellos que conociendo un tema ellos hagan una pregunta del tema no que respondan las preguntas que uno les hace sino que hagan una pregunta a ellos normalmente eh, dice él que lo ha implementado y que los estudiantes que están como muy, muy, todavía muy bajos de conceptos hacen preguntas que son como la primera del libro y, las, y los estudiantes que ya han entendido mucho más hacen preguntas bastante más complejas y que uno bien puede ver, digamos, cuántos años están viendo realmente esa asking the students directly, and as you said, that's not going to be the only data. But why not involve them as part of the process? And also be willing to tell them, when you disagree, you do it in a professional way. And you explain why you might disagree. But as long as I think that the students, when I've had that, I've talked to students and asked for input through, say, uh, anonymous surveys, I always report back on the survey to the students. And I say, you asked for this, we can do that. Here's something that you've asked for. I'll give you an example. You've asked me to work through more example problems for you. And whenever I do that, the only response I get is to ask for more example problems. It isn't actually helping the learning, and here's why. So I, I think it's completely fair to tell them no. The other thing, just I want to give you a little bit of a story. We'll, we'll get into how to motivate students. But even Eric Mazur at Harvard, even in this course that you saw how far they went, he will still have a few students who will come up to him and say, I am not paying $50,000 to have to learn this all on my own. And isn't that interesting? Yes, you have to learn it all yourself. And he's trying to help them as much as they can. So even Eric, who is a gifted, lecturer and a gifted teacher still has a few students and they can be vocal and the only way to respond back is with data and the only way to respond back is to make sure not to listen to just those few because I find it very hard to ignore them. You know, sometimes when you have a few who complain a lot, they tend to take up a lot of your attention when, it, when of course they should. They're just two or three out of 30 or 100. Anyway, so many, many things. I like that also coming up with questions, asking students so it's different ways of, of having the students come up with ideas and getting a sense of it. Can I give it to you? Thank you. Eh, bueno, nosotros primero discutimos un poco sobre lo que hacemos y nos dimos cuenta que en realidad uno, uno 
sabe que es importante, pero hace poco sobre la realimentación. Muchas veces uno, la, lo más tradicional que se hace es lo que sabemos que no funciona muy bien, que verle las caras a los estudiantes, a quienes entienden, preguntarles y que respondan algunos, eh, etc. Pero eh, aquí vimos como algunas de las técnicas que creemos eh, como más exitosas y en general el grupo cree que la técnica de instrucción de pares es probablemente la más apropiada para recibir una realimentación más inmediata eh, y sobre todo digamos usando alguna técnica como los clickers que te están diciendo prácticamente en tiempo real qué es lo que los estudiantes están entendiendo o no están entendiendo y no solo los que participan o no solo los que están a la partida eh, algunas que me parecieron interesantes era por ejemplo que era que el grupo me parecieron importantes lo de la lista de hipoteca esto es eh, la, lo de la lista de cotejo que es eh, establecer digamos al, algunas a, habilidades que el estudiante debe alcanzar eh, algunas cuantas y establecer si no lo hizo del todo si está si está en proceso o si, eh, o si lo alcanzó bien y entonces eh, antes de la clase es decidido escoger al azar cinco estudiantes o seis estudiantes del total ponerlos a trabajar en grupo sí, ¿verdad? Sí,
one thing that I did that I highly recommend to all of you, it takes only one hour. You pair off with one of your colleagues here, and you go sit in the back of their classroom when they're teaching, and you just observe. So I did this when I was with the down in, with Eric in Cambridge, and I went around Harvard, and I sat in the back of the courses. No one kicked me out, so I figured, why not? I went over to MIT, I went to Owen College, and I sat in the back of the room. And that was so interesting. Because when you sit in the back of the room, you get a completely different perspective than the person at the front. The person at the front, you see some people nodding, yes, I understand. On the back, you see certain websites coming up on the computers. And some of them were, well, let's just say, uh, a little, I like, don't think they should have been looking at these websites in public. Anyway, you get a sense that only a small percentage of the students are actually participating. So something very easy for you to do with a colleague. You can just sit in the back of their classroom. They can sit in the back of your classroom. And give some feedback. Just what's actually, what you observe in the room. Anyway, so there's certainly other ones, including um, one that we want immediate feedback. And that's something we've talked about. Another thing would be interesting would be to survey at the end of their entire degree. And that's a bigger job, so maybe we can't take that off. But that's very valuable. Wouldn't that be interesting? What course did you really help your learning throughout these, your years at, 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 at your school? Anyway, thank you. Buenas. En, los, en este grupo nosotros estuvimos conversando, tal vez nos oyeron riéndonos un ratito, porque estábamos pensando que una de las formas interesantes de evaluar el aprendizaje era por medio de juegos. Eh, en el caso de química, por ejemplo, hay unos temas que son el ángulo de enlace, eh, los efectos de pantalla, la formación de moléculas que podrían evaluarse mediante juegos que llevaran más materiales, bombas y otras cosas, ¿verdad? y pudiéramos evaluar eh, a nuestros estudiantes eh, su desempeño. Luego Laura nos propuso la idea de foros en línea para no invertir el tiempo de la clase, sino más bien pues, eh, evaluar externamente y que con la discusión pudiéramos ir analizando la retroalimentación y la profundidad de las ideas de los estudiantes. En el tema de mapas mentales, desarrollar un tema interconectando conceptos para ver cómo los cerebros están organizando la información y también para poderles ayudar a los jóvenes en caso de, de información muy desordenada. Hay casos, hay casos muy interesantes en esto. Nosotros manejamos mucho en la carrera de Ingeniería Ambiental el uso de estudios de caso, sobre todo para cursos avanzados en donde se les ofrece un caso y tienen que desarrollar un tipo de evaluación. Y un último tema que le denominamos charadas, el compañero Ben nos contaba que hay como varias cráneos, juegos de pictograma, juegos en general, usando tarjetas y dándoles algún tipo de concepto y que ellos tuvieran que eh, explicar ese tipo de concepto y los compañeros pues lo adivinaran. De alguna manera así ingeniosa que el estudiante tuviera que manejar todos estos conceptos. Eh, eso fue lo que planteamos en el grupo 4. Gracias. So, one colleague at a, at a workshop, when I was talking about peer instruction and how students are motivated, they want to know if they got it right or wrong, and he said, oh, you're just gamifying education, and I made this comment to another workshop, that some people might view this as just gamifying education, and someone just yelled out in the middle of the workshop, is it, so what? If you are, that's fine, if the students are engaged. And one aspect about this, when we are trying to open a back channel, we want the students to be motivated to do it, we probably don't want marks associated with it, because that's going to change the results. But we still need the students motivated enough to give us good feedback. And a way of doing that is through some sort of game format. Because 
you know, even if there's silly prizes or no prizes at all, they want to win. And so they're going to try hard. Because if you open up the back channel to get feedback, but they're not motivated to use it, it's not going to give you very good feedback.
So it's not just good enough to ask them for feedback, they have to see results. Also though, still, you are the professor. It's up to you whether you want to work and do something or some change on feedback or not. And certainly, I would never say that you should get rid of that, that role. That's a very important role. And it's up to you what to actually do. At this point, I think we've worked hard, and I think it's time for, for a break. Uh, so please, uh, 20 minutes, and then we'll come back and talk about details in the implementation. Except then we have to have all sunblock, I guess. So what came up in almost all of the what you want out of the um, workshop were, were practical details. Eric and I, Eric Deser is, uh, as I mentioned before, I have the highest respect for him. And what he's particularly skilled at is the high level. I see myself as being uh, in the trenches with you, not working in the fancy institution. Well, maybe your, your institution is, is, is fancier than mine. I don't, I'm not going to try and evaluate it. So I don't think we're harder to do. So we don't have that sort of funny. How do we make it? Especially when we don't have any more time. We just don't. So we have to somehow switch what we're doing we have to, we're going to have to, part of what we'll be doing tomorrow is figuring out what we're going to give up to allow us to put time into some of these things. It's not just good enough to work harder right We just don't have to. So, details of implementation. What, uh, just for this last session for today, we'll go very concrete, no theory, and try and understand how to help motivate students. And from what I've learned from the literature, my courses in both first year and our fourth year laser optics course. And then also revisiting how to manage your classes. And I mentioned that there will be, just so you can plan ahead, one final group task to identify the obstacles you will face when you introduce these approaches in your own course. What I see in the literature and that these new faculty workshops are there's a tendency for people to hear about an approach, they try it somewhat, it doesn't work as well as they hope, and they give up. And I think you just have to have reasonable expectations that if you're trying something new, it might not work out as well as you hope the first time. So planning ahead for those obstacles will make it easier for you to overcome. Hey, I mean, it might work beautifully the first time. And certainly, I'll tell you the certain aspects that I've had to work very easily. For one thing, my students love to talk. They love talking in class. That is easy for them to do. If they get watched properly, we'll talk about that. And I'll give you a little story, just to begin with, of a situation I faced where it was getting really uncomfortable for me as an instructor. My students were very comfortable with the, with the groups they were in. They trusted their neighbors. This was about halfway through the term. The result was that at the beginning of every class, they wouldn't shut up. And I would try to get their attention. And I would even occasionally, you know, flash the lights. And it was getting very awkward. And I started trying to go up to them into look at them and say, could you please quiet it down? And it was this ugly feeling of me trying to just, and it didn't work, of course, because the people over here that they go back to talking. And I thought, here, I'm this brilliant instructor. I know how to teach people so well. I visited all these different universities. And my son's primary school teacher, my son who's 10 years old, that teacher knows how to get the kids to shut up, and I know. <laughs>
figure out if they know it or not. So I changed how I started the class. I just started, instead of having a review section about what we've been learning, an agenda slide about where we'd be going, I just put up a question that was like a review question. But again, had some relatively high level understanding. And it was like magic. I put it up, rah, 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 I was talking, rah, 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 rah. I'd have to say, the poll is open, to make sure they understood. And then, their attention shifted to what they were doing Friday night, and who was doing what with who in the residence, and it shifted to what was on the board, and the question, and it, it, it quieted it down, like that. So I guess I'm saying, here, that was me, and that wasn't five years ago or ten years ago, that was in fall. So that was not that many months ago. I faced this problem, it was an obstacle, and I had to try and find a solution, and the solution was to go with what, is, what worked well for the students. And so that's fine. And I was able to make that into a review question, so if they did well on it, that was fine, if not, I could review it. So it made a lot of sense in terms of the pedagogy as well. All right, so where are we going? Let's start with trying to help students get ready to learn in class. Because you know if they walk in prepared in some way, they're going to have much better interaction and discussion. They have a bunch of people in the room that don't know anything. You're not going to be able to use peer instruction very well. So, the problem that I had before I went to peer instruction this is something that's been talked about in some of the years. Is that I had this uh, major challenge that I thought was the most important thing. That major challenge was driving me to distraction and making me teach in ways that I knew were bad ways of teaching. And I, I, then I see that some of you have exactly the same problem. And I think the first way to solve a problem is to give it a name. And I asked my son, this is my, the, the, the one who did the pushing, to draw a cartoon for me of this. So this was me before peer instruction, where I was teaching in such a bad way because I was trying to serve this monster. This monster is the content piece. This is the syllabus of all the different topics we need to cover. And this is the monster that makes you do things you don't want to do. You have only three minutes left in your lecture, but you have four ideas that you have to give them. So you just, if you're using slides, you just put through them really quickly. Or maybe you just write them on the board super fast without explaining it. The moment you're doing that is when the content piece. Content piece is forcing you to do those bad things. And you're trying to serve covering all the contents rather than serve your students and they will run screaming from the Of course, it's an exaggeration. But it was a stress that I always felt because I could never manage to deliver as much content as the prof who did the course beforehand. He always seemed to move through it a lot faster. And I couldn't. Well, that's a problem. And now we've got an even bigger problem. Because with peer instruction, we have to move some of that information transfer out of the lecture hall. So in a way, it's the solution. And because of that, I'm not going to have to say everything. The students don't need me to say it for them to access that information. They don't need to see it on this PowerPoint slide. They don't need to see me write it out in front of them. I would say that at one point it was important to do that because the students need to have detailed notes. But those times are long are gone a long time ago. They have access to the information through other channels. So we just have to make sure they're able to access it. And you have to recognize this fact that using peer instruction means you cannot deliver as much content in class. I've seen people who struggle with implementation if they're trying to say everything and add more stuff into the class. Because then what ends up happening is extra stress and things get even more wrong. Alright, so how do we deal with this? We have to tame the beast. Again, my son, Adrian, 
And the way we do it, this is that textbook that my students were already buying, that we didn't really make use of that much. Now we just make use of it in the specific way that I deliver content as I assign readings. I have colleagues who do videos and put the videos on them. Or similar to the Khan Academy sets of videos where it's just uh, one, it's basically you can watch the, the analysis done online. They do that. That takes a lot of time. For me, it was very easy. It took me an hour to determine what the readings were in my course. I already knew the syllabus was. And so I was able to then deliver to them what the course readings were, say that's the content, so I could focus on helping them see it. And for me, this was a liberation. If the students didn't want to come to class because they knew all the content, or knew what the content was to be, that's fine. They still came to class, though. In fact, they came more, even when I told them what the content was. Added. So I meet them at the back of the room, first day, and I give them something that looks like this. But I've already read the term. Every day, they need to be 14 pages, or this is uh, 19 pages, or 6 pages. So they know ahead of time exactly what that's going to be. And they can work ahead if they want. If they have schedule, maybe they're scheduled, maybe they have jobs, maybe they have family or responsibilities. If they miss, they can always know what the content is. And so in a way, we solve a lot of problems by doing this. Now, this is not something I developed. This is something we, again, as the second, you know, the second wave, taking ideas from other people. This is known in the literature as just-in-time teaching. That terminology comes from manufacturing. The idea is just in time manufacturing, that the raw materials of parts wouldn't come to the assembly line until exactly when they are needed. So that's a, a, a book on it, if that's of interest, but I'll tell you how I implemented it in my courses to get right down to the details of it. So, these readings. Now, I know that uh, for most of you, you have two lectures, one of you were telling me, two lectures a week that are 100 minutes. Lecture. I have three lectures a week, 50 minutes. Your style is actually the, the way that Harvard is, and Eric does it, um, with two lectures a week. And I tell them what the reading is, they saw that, and then I ask them to respond to questions. And we use alpacas, so there's different technologies for doing that. I'll show you some examples of that. This is me, this is my current the university, uses Moodle, which is a free learning management system. And I can just program it to set these questions. So it's not just good enough to do a reading, it's answer these questions. And the most important one is this. Did you do the reading? Yes or no? And what was challenging? Explain. If you had no problems, what did you find interesting? Explain. Now there's a trick here. Why do you think? And I'm not going to do a clicker question. I want one of you to answer. Why do you think I need to put in that second question? I mean, I am interested in what they I'm interested in. But why for implementation does it have to be there? And I will give the microphone to someone to answer that. Think of what, if you're a student, and you don't have that question, you're a little lazy, or you're rushed, or maybe the bar is uh, already open and your friends said they wanted to meet you there. Maybe. <laughs> so why do I need the question? Oh, sorry, just wait. I didn't turn it on. Eh, yo lo pondría porque sería muy fácil eh, contestar. Bueno, si la hice y no, todo en realidad estaba muy fácil. Entonces, eh, se en la, en la respuesta. Yes, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. So students find out that it's easier for them because I'm forcing them to explain something. It's easier for them to actually tell me what they had a problem with and explain it than to try and make up why something was interesting and explain it. So it's just one of those little bits of implementation that are important. If I do not have this question, a third of my students, a third easily, will say, oh, it's all fine. 
and almost always those are the students that, that really need the help. So, question one is the one that's the most important, and that's the one that I make use of mostly for setting the topics of the next lecture. Question two and three are just about content, again, with these explain boxes. So, questions that they have to respond, and then that they always have to explain. And that's important in terms of it's not just they're able to check answers and get it done in five minutes. They have to justify their answer. And that helps me understand their misconception. All right, so that's a, my, a learning management system for Moodle. I just want to show you other ones. Uh, again, just their different softwares. This is the interactive learning tool from Harvard. Again, these are students' responses about e &M. And then we can discuss this one tomorrow if we have time. Uh, it's another site, sharpscholar.com, which allows me to get analytics on students' responses and get information about where they had problems. And it's more of an integrated solution. It's quite awesome. So it doesn't really matter what implementation. The technology is very useful here for collecting all those answers. All right. I believe, I know that what my students tell me is if I don't put grades on it, then I don't really mean it's important. I put that down. So I have to put some grades on this. And you as the instructor get to pick how you're going to grade it. So I'm going to ask you then, these students have just done the reading, they put in some answers, what do you think is the right way to grade them? Just for participation? For best effort? You grade for correctness? In other words, it's as long as a zero, it's right to one. Or none of the above, they should not count the grades at all. And I hope you have your clicker skills. The poll is open. I'm curious to see what you think.
Do I read only a few? Do I read enough to find the trend of the misconceptions? Do I read most of them to make sure I do not miss any real, really good questions? Do I read all of them because I need to read them all? The poll is open. All right, and I'll show you the results. Just to, what do you think? Eight percent of you think I'm very lazy. <laughs> well, half of you are saying enough to find a, a trend. Maybe I foreshadowed. That's what I end up doing. That there's I have 200 students. I can't read them all. It's not going to happen. I don't have time. <clears throat> But what comes out very clear, especially since the reading is only a few concepts, the trend, I just need to sample a big enough say, subset to be able to determine some sort of idea of what the problem is. The only thing I would recommend though is to make sure I don't keep reading the same 10, 20, 30 students. Or else that would be biasing my data. So I have to make sure somehow that I'm going through and reading different ones for different students. Now, how do I grade them? Frankly, I grade them pretty fast. I throw them all into an Excel spreadsheet. And after the first couple of weeks, I just start looking for empty please explain boxes. An empty please explain box is a zero. That's very fast to be able to find. So the bar isn't that high, but it still gives them feedback. And it's still enough so I have the feedback. Because I'm going to use their questions for my lunch. That's essential. All right, so a few of the students will even get an email back from me answering their questions. So even before lecture, they're going to get this. That I'm reading to give them the sense. And I try and make sure that by week six, everyone has gotten at least one email back from me. I'm going to ask you this. If you do this with your students, which email response do you think your students would prefer? Good job. Good point. We will discuss this in class. Maybe a page number to the part of the reading, or a, a detailed answer. Nothing of me saying, I know you need to know this and you don't understand it. 
And so you asked me this. You asked me how to do this. Let's try and figure it out together. All right. So also, I can't reiterate the importance of providing feedback after feedback. Oh, sorry, question, please.
All right, I'll show you what your answer is. Most of you have an answer D, and maybe that you realize that because I forced it to be a possible answer. <laughs> so that's what, and you're right, that's what my students, and actually that surprised me. Because I saw that the important things were, you know, that they were controlling the lecture. I thought that would be what they were saying. But it was worse. And I can't tell them they're wrong. And certainly it is the case that they're better prepared for class. You're going to get more out of class. They will do better on the exam. All right. So I just want to summarize then this just-in-time teaching section. What have we learned or seen? You need somehow to obtain the content piece. Each of us have that content piece in the room, telling us that we have a lot of content to cover. Help get your students to help you obtain the content. And how you do it, uh, whether it be assigned readings, some sort of video delivery, your own lecture notes. Maybe that's it. You've already written out detailed lecture notes. Why not put those online ahead of time so students have access to it? And that way you don't feel like you need to say everything in class, or you need to put everything onto the, to the whiteboard or the blackboard. That if you can get good feedback from students ahead of class, then you're going to get be able to teach them, help them better. And that's the first step of them learning, just figuring out what they don't understand. Also, do you see how the entire atmosphere of the class changes? It's no longer me telling them, you have to know this, and you have to know this, and you have to know this. Now it's the case, it's the syllabus, and I'm helping them figure it out, and helping them with the hard stuff. That success requires many incentives. You know, this, this is a hard thing to do because you're asking your students to do a lot of work all the way through the term. And they might, depending on where they are in their university career, they might have gotten used to being able to just cram the night before the exam, study intensely, and squeak by, and then forget. And you're asking them to change their behavior, and that's, that's hard to do. But again, study after study shows that just trying to learn something the night before the exam you might be doing okay on the, on the exam, but you don't retain that. You need to repeatedly come back to the same information to really learn it deep. Right. So, I just wanted to also talk about, I was going to have you go into a group session now, but I'm also sensitive to the time. So I just wanted to also talk about the implementation details. Even though we've seen your instruction, I wanted to really deconstruct it. Uh, so that you can really be aware of what we were doing in this room. So, and remember this is all working towards being able to identify obstacles. That's the last thing of our day. Obstacles that are going to get in the way of you being able to implement some form of just-in-time teaching in here. Right. So, I'll remind you of this, that this is the anatomy, the algorithm of a concept test. But I'm going to say implementation matters greatly. So let's look at this. I'm going to ask you the question, what's the least important part? Students go in after the, the you know, quiet introspection, so that's that first Oh, here. Peer discussion. Student voting after that peer discussion. The professor doing a wrap-up explanation. Or including concept questions tested on the exam. Didn't talk about that much. But it certainly is a part of peer instruction that we actually examine and ask students to uh, solve concept-related problems on exam. So what do you think is the least important of all of those?
E is allowed. <laughs> I'll give you a confession. I never use Turning Point. So this is software that I only see uh, at some workshops that I present at. At my institution, we use high ticket technology. So that's my excuse uh, for uh, not being perfect on the software. But it's great that, that uh, you were able to bring in this technology so we can give it a test run. All right. So of this, I didn't have you go to character action, but most of you were going to either A or E. I, it's a case of, I, it's an unfair question in a way. I, don't, I can't really tell you what I think is the least important part. What I actually think, though, is particularly relevant is, um, well, all of 96% of you said keep feed. In other words, keep the peer discussion. And why is that interesting, I think? Is that if we look at the literature and look at how it's been implemented, so this is from Dancy and Henderson from Michigan. They look at different uh, pedagogical practices and change of physics faculty. So, this is one of the places where they saw that 64% of people know peer instruction. And of those who use it, only 27%, only one quarter actually use peer interaction in peer instruction multiple times. So this worries me a little bit when I see this, that people say that they're using it, but it seems like a lot of them are taking away the peer interaction part. I know why they're doing it. The context. They don't have enough time, and so they think it would be better for them to explain the answer than for their students to talk to each other. But I would be very careful about that. Certainly all the studies that validate peer, peer instruction as a good teaching technique involve peer interaction. So just be careful what, when you do an implementation, that you don't get rid of the really important parts. All right, so we're going to deconstruct it. I got another question, another physics question for you. It's a question on um, DC circuits. I can think about the voltage across a resistor and it's just being equal to the current times the resistance. And also this is known by, it doesn't matter what it's called, but I can tell you the rule is that the sum of the voltage is a rather closed loop is zero. So we're going to do a question on this, but we're really going to make sure and understand every step. I'll explain the science a little bit more. This is a basic circuit. I have two light bulbs that are each six ohms. So I, can, I know from the sum of the voltages around the closed loop is zero, that if I go around this loop, if this is 12 volts, then this must be 12 volts going down, so negative 12 volts. So that means I have 12 volts across my 6 ohm resistor. So if I do my math right, 12 divided by 6, I can figure out the current is 2 amps. Ah, but I can also think about it this way. That's another loop. It also has to, again, sum to zero, so as I go 12 volts up, I have to go 12 volts down. And again, I can calculate two amps. So, they'll each light bulb will get the same amount of current, and they'll have the same range. And if that isn't working for you, don't worry. It's late in the day, and I'm trying to make sure that you remember uh, first year physics. The question that we're going to explore is this, and I'll read it out to you. I have a circuit consisting of two identical light bulbs, like what we just saw. They have identical brightness, that's a 9 volt battery. And I close this switch. And if I close this switch, what happens to the brightness of bulb A? Is it going to increase? Because there's more current going through? Is it going to not change? Because it's going to be the same amount of current? Or is it going to decrease? Because there is 
So the poll is open.
So most of you are saying, put away the cell phones. And I don't agree. But I can understand why you might do that. I see it as an indication that they're done. They're not getting any more value out of the peer instruction. So close it down and move on to the next stage. Uh, and that way it also doesn't become a, uh, let's call it a power battle between you and your students. Why not just make use of that information? But I tell them. I say, oh, I see some cell phones coming out. Let's move on. And that also tends to help. Alright, so, some things that you can do after the second vote, if you want. You can show them the histogram, like I should do it. You can congratulate them if things got better. Because that was their work, and you should recognize that they did that work. But you definitely should always explain the right answer. They might have got it right, even though for the wrong reason. So, on this question, we're not going to take much time on it, but I will tell you the right answer on this question. Because I think it would bother you, at least some of you, if I don't. I'm getting some knocks. <laughs> so, how would I suggest you might think about it? We, beforehand, this entire 9 volt battery, the entire voltage, was through this loop, was dropped across this loop. So, these are identical. So that means I have four and a half volts here and four and a half volts here. That's before the switch is shut. If the switch is shut and I look at this circuit, I have to still have the sum of the voltages equal to zero in a circuit. There's no batteries. So that means that the voltage from here to here has to be zero. Or else I'll break that rule. If the voltage from here to here is zero, it means there's no current. So another way of thinking about it is all the current is now flowing through here because there's no resistance. But that means now I have this big loop that has 9 volts going just across pole A. So I go from 4.5 volts across pole A to 9 volts. So you get this really surprising result, it's not obvious, that the light, that the brightness increases. In other words, A is the correct answer. And if you have any questions or comments, please talk to me after class, and we will discuss this in more detail. Alright, so in the last 15 minutes, I just want to say, and they're still talking about the program. The last 15 minutes, what I would ask you to do is the following. You've now seen some of the implementation, most of the implementation details. So, to summarize, make sure you launch them well. I had one of your colleagues come up and do it in Spanish. That's very important. If you just say, talk about the answer, they'll be kind of quiet. They won't know what to do. You have to give them specific instructions that they turn, and you have to use that word. Was it voy? No, but go. Go. Dead. What he said. <laughs> Students, have a, you have a physical reaction to that word, and you want to make use of that. Because you want them to get into that discussion quickly. Check in with them, and afterwards congratulate them if they got better and explain the answer to them. Alright, so in the last 15 minutes, I want you and your groups to identify what the obstacles are. We are not going to report back today. We're going to do that tomorrow morning. But it's really important that you record down these obstacles now while these things are fresh in your mind. So we have 13 minutes to do that. So if you could please turn and work in your groups, what obstacles will you face to introduce just-in-time teaching and or peer instruction in your course at, at your school? Please. And if you have any questions, I will certainly be available after 4 o'clock if you want to talk about things. And I will also mention, Tomorrow, please bring your computers.